Welcome to episode 519 of the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I'm Ashley Scott Myers, screenwriter and blogger at SellingYourScreenplay.com. Today I am interviewing Chad Farron, who just did a feature horror film called Scalper, which is actually a sequel to a feature he did a couple of years ago called Nightcaller. We talked through this film, how he happened to do a sequel for Nightcaller, and then how he ultimately got this film funded and produced. He's very candid, has a lot of firsthand knowledge about independent film, and really shares a lot of that with us. So stay tuned for that interview. SYS's six-figure screenplay contest is open for submissions. Just go to www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash contest. If your script is ready, definitely submit now to save money. Our preliminary deadline is February 29th. We're looking for low budget shorts shorts and features. I'm defining low budget as less than six figures. In other words, less than 1 million US dollars. We've got lots of industry judges reading the scripts in the later rounds. We're giving away thousands in cash and prizes. We have a short film category as well, 30 pages or less. So if you have a low budget short script, by all means, please submit that script. We've got a number of industry judge producers who are specifically looking for short scripts. Once again, if you want to submit to the contest or learn more about it, just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash contest. And also, again, this year we are running an in-person film festival in tandem with our screenplay contest. It's for low-budget films produced for less than $1 million U.S. dollars. We have features and shorts category in that as well. The festival is going to play, take place here in Los Angeles, California from October 4th to October 6th. If you produced a short film or know someone who has, by all means, please do submit it. Shorts are easy to program at a festival like this. So I can run two or three or do a whole section of features. Um, so always, um, so shorts, as I said, they're just really easy to program. Um, they're fun. You bring in a lot of people. Um, you really can have a good time. So we're definitely planning on accepting lots of shorts for this festival like we did this past year. Again, features are definitely welcome and we will be screening some features as well. But, um, but just for the low budget ethos of this festival, we really do try and showcase a lot of low budget shorts. If you have a finished film and would like to submit to the festival, you can go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash festival. You'll be directed to the film freeway page which is where we are taking all our submissions for the film festival if you do find this episode valuable please help me out by giving me a review in itunes or leaving a comment on youtube or retweeting the podcast on twitter or liking or sharing it on facebook these social media shares really do help spread word about the podcast so they're very much appreciated any websites or links that I mention the podcast can be found on my blog in the show notes. I also publish a transcript with every episode in case you'd rather read the show or look at something later on. You can find all the podcast show notes at www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash podcasts, and then just look for episode 519. Just a quick few words about what I've been working on over the last few weeks. So mostly what I'm spending my time on, I've been talking about this and it's not really screen play or screenwriting specific, but um, I've been moving Selling Your Screenplay and a number of other sites that I run to a new server. It's um, I basically got Selling Your Screenplay working on the new server, but there's still a lot of little things that aren't working quite right. So I'll be fighting with those over the next couple of weeks and we'll hopefully have it wrapped up here shortly. If you do see any errors on the sellingyourscreenplay.com page, please do let me know. I'm sure that there are some errors somewhere. Um, hopefully you won't see them, but I'm sure I have not covered or fixed every single little issue. Hopefully I can get back into screenwriting and producing very soon. But right now, as I said, I'm just overwhelmed with some of these technical issues. I did hear from our distributor on the Rideshare Killer yesterday. She sent me an email. Sounds like they're putting together a deal for the film, which is always exciting to hear. But um, they needed some audio tracks, some m and &E audio tracks, just music and effects audio tracks. Those get pulled out when you produce a film and you create what's called an m and &E track. Um, and in this case, it sounds like they want separate tracks for the music. The M stands for music, the E stands for effects. So it's a, a music and effects tracks. And the reason they need that, they need obviously the music and the effects. And then they for foreign language sales, um, they're going to go in and dub. And um, so they don't want the dialogue because they're going to dub that, but they still need the sound effects um, so it's very typical to need this m and &E track um, these m and &E tracks when you start selling your film to foreign distributors but you know as with everything it's not as easy to find these things and track these down and and so I had to go through all of our old dr drives and find them and then um, I've got to zip them and then upload them it's about four gigs worth of audio files and then um, 
and then upload those so that she can download them and then use them for whatever she needs in this deal. Um, sales are definitely slow, uh, slowing down with RSK. So you know, a sale like this is definitely nice, um, kind of keep us motivated and hopefully maybe we can do another marketing push here sometime soon and get sales going again. Anyway, those are the things that I have been working on over the last couple of weeks. Now let's get into the main segment. Today I am interviewing screenwriter and director Chad Farron. Here is the interview. Welcome, Chad, to the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I really appreciate you coming on the show with me today. Hey, thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here. So to start out, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your background. Where did you grow up and how did you get interested in the entertainment business? Uh, I grew up in Minnesota, actually, on a small farm about 30 miles south of Minneapolis. And, uh, you know, I got just a love for cinema my entire life, you know, I, I just remember, you know, at an early age, my father bringing home a Betamax with Taxi Driver and Saturn V, and <laughs> I was hooked. Hmm. And so what were some of your steps to turning this into an actual career? You're living far from Hollywood. Um, how did you how did you sort of make that transition? How did you just start to think? I mean, and I think there's a lot of people listening to this. We're probably in the same boat. I myself grew up in Annapolis, Maryland. Um, you know, it was a city ish, but there were not a lot of filmmakers there either. So, you know, I had to sort of strike out and find those people. How did you sort of take those first steps to having a career in the entertainment business? Uh, well, you know, the, the earliest I was going to a career uh, community college and I took a theater class and just, you know, the, one of the um, projects was to write and direct and to act in something. So I kind of did that and had just such a, a joy doing it. And I'm like, you know what, this is what I want to do for a career. And I remember telling my mother, you know, hey, I think I'm going to move out to California and, you know, tr give a <laughs> give it a shot. Mm -hmm. And she said, well, why don't I call up? Um, uh, there's a woman who is your babysitter. Uh, you know, long ago, you know, Lori Leahy is her name, and uh, she's now married to a producer, Mike Leahy. So let me try and get their number and see if uh, they can get you a job or something. So she called them up and uh, they said, hey, well, come on out. We, we're, we're doing the prophecy. He can uh, be a production assistant. Huh. So I loaded my car, drove out and started working for them as a production assistant and uh, worked there for a few years on numerous films and, you know, kind of learned the the ins and outs of filmmaking, you know, kind of doing everything from a production assistant to a camera assistant to, uh, you know, a gaffer. I mean, you know, learning how everything and every job and kind of really knowing how it's made and then selling my house in 98 in Minnesota and took that money and made my first film uh, called Unspeakable. And, you know, I've been doing it ever since. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So let's talk about that. I noticed on IMDb, you've pretty much written, directed and produced pretty much all your films, correct? Yes. Yes. So, so like the first short that you did bloodbath, was this during the time that you were doing the PA stuff and you sort of did that on the weekends, you, you were able to marshal resources from that. Right. I was working as a production assistant and I was in a car accident and I took the money from that car accident, made a uh, bloodbath and, uh, you know, kind mm -hmm. of, you know, kind of knowing that, you know, every penny counts. So it was really trying to, that was the first little film to realize, you know, you're hiring a good, crew you're casting it you're doing all this mm -hmm. stuff on your own while working a, a day job so it was kind of shot it on the weekend and mm -hmm. you know edited at uh the production company and you know they were gracious enough to let me use their editing equipment at that mm -hmm. time an avid was you know a, a big fucking deal it cost yeah. you know, a hundred thousand dollars to you know own one and they you know they had rented one and i was using it they were cutting another film. So on the weekend, they allowed me to edit, uh, unspeak mm -hmm. our uh, bloodbath. And, you know, it was just one of those things of, you know, back then it was really, it helped of who you knew and who had equipment and who had these things mm -hmm. to, uh, make these things and get them done. But it, times have really changed because anyone can make a movie on their cell phone and cut it yeah. at home on the computer. And yeah, you know, yeah. It's a good time actually to make films. So how did you just have the confidence to say, okay, now I'm going to be a writer, director, producer, um, just for in yourself and then convincing these other people, the crew and the cast to come on board. You don't have a lot of experience. You know, you're young and hungry and energetic. Um, but how do you have the confidence to do that? And just any, any valuable insight that maybe you can give us for people that maybe want to do that first short or feature. Well, I think, you know, if, if you have a love for it and you, you, you're going to do it no matter what and money and, you know, crew and all those things shouldn't be a limitation. If you have to shoot it yourself, shoot it yourself. If you have to write it yourself, write it yourself. It was it was for me. It was I didn't have the money to buy a screenplay or I didn't have the money to do, you know, these certain things. So it's, it's kind of just forcing yourself 
to do those things. And, mm-hmm. you know, writing was something that, you know, is uh, I kind of it's hard to describe of, you know, I, I don't necessarily say I have a talent for any of these things, but I have a drive to get a film made. So I force myself to whether it's, you know, read more, watch more films, do whatever it is to help you get become a better writer or a better you know filmmaker, whatever it is, and just kind of hone those skills. And the best way to hone them is to make the film. And I don't go out at any time thinking I'm making the greatest film ever made because that kind of already sets you up for failure. If you go out and say, I'm going to make the best film I can for $20,000 or the best film I can for a hundred thousand dollars. And you amass the, you know, the most talented people you can that have the same drive and the same ambition as you do. And, you know, you you do the best you can. And that's really for me, what it lays down to of just take those limitations you have and try to turn them into an advantage, whether it's, you know, a nine day shooting schedule Mm -hmm. or, you know, a script that you have to crank out in two weeks or whatever it is. And being able to, If you trust your actor, if the actor comes on there and says the line better than it was written or comes up with some ideas that are better than you have, then take them and, you know, Mm -hmm. take credit for it. Because, you know, it lays it eventually all lays down on the director, the producer on, you know, the failure or the success of a project. So, Mm -hmm. you know, I kind of take take the talented people that I amass around me and use, you know, to an advantage because you know usually you know when you're making these on a on a nickel and in a fast amount of time you, everyone's kind of got to have their uh, their game up so mm-hmm. i find it exciting and, and thrilling to be making these on a you know a low budget and in a short period of time and you just get better and better and better and better Mm-hmm. So as you're working at this production company, um, like one of the things that surprises me, you sort of told us a little bit about your childhood and things and there, you didn't mention horror as something that you were just super in love with. Um, was that sort of a love? Cause you mentioned taxi driver as a film, but were you in, you've done a lot of horror. So were you sort of really in love with her or was that more of just a function of you going to be working as a PA at a production company that was doing horror and you sort of learn the ins and outs that way? No, well, it's just a love of, you know, cinema in general and just, you know, you know, I love Westerns. I love film noir. I love, you know, comedy. The, the, mm-hmm. There's a thing for horror. It was the easiest and the most artistic in a sense. You could do, you know, you can have comedy in it. You can have horror, film noir. You could have all these kind of different elements within the horror genre. And to me, that's the most expressive and the most uh you know, fun. I mean, you could, you know, write a love scene in one, you know, second and then have a, you know, her head ripped off in the next. So there's, there's different elements that you can throw in from all genres of cinema within the horror fantasy, you know, world. And I find mm-hmm. that the most uh, thrilling. And for, for me, you know, it's it goes back to being enthralled with The Twilight Zone or Alfred Hitchcock Presents or One Step Beyond or Outer Limits, or things that as a kid really shaped me as, you know, a filmmaker of things that, you know, uh, go bump in the night is, is just more fun for me. I, I, I enjoy mm-hmm. it. But I, you know, would love to tackle any genre if, if the opportunity arises. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, so let's dig into your latest film, the feature film called Scalper. Maybe you can give us a quick log line or pitch for that film. What is that film all about? Sure. It's uh, it's about a psychic who uh, is uh, terrorized by a serial killer. And in the first film, uh, Nightcaller, she uh, got a, she was a phone psychic and she got a call from a serial killer and she predicted his murders before he committed them. So it was kind of, it's a sequel to that film, but you don't necessarily have to see the first film. It, it kind of stands on its own. And that was my whole thing of doing a sequel to begin with. If you can make a sequel, that's not necessarily a sequel. It's able to stand on its own is, is, is the best way to do it. Mm-hmm. And where did this idea come from? What was sort of the genesis of this story idea? Uh, Susan Creever, who is the star of Nightcaller, basically she, you know, was such a joy to work with that it was one of those things of, you know, she said, hey, I I really love this character. Would you want to do a sequel at any point? And, you know, the ball started spinning in my Mm -hmm. head and uh, the script came easily. You know, I usually write these things in a couple of weeks and shoot them in nine to 10 days and uh, edit it in a couple of weeks and then, you know, get it out there. Mm-hmm. So let's take, um, let's walk through your writing process a little bit. I'm just always curious to hear how people do. It sounds like you're a very quick writer, but um, just where do you typically write? When do you typically write? Do you have a home office? Do you go to Starbucks? Are you in the morning? Are you late at night? Just what does your sort of writing process look like? Um, I usually, you know, on a, a script like this, if I have a hook that, you know, for this one, it was the, who I knew the killer was, that once that clicked, it was, you know, I would start 
you know, in the morning, usually around 10 a.m., write for about five hours, you know, take a break. And then it usually is if whatever inspires me, usually if I fall asleep, I'll hit a dream and a scene will click out. And in the morning, you know, you, you write it down, I'll jot notes, come back to it. It's all about, you know, just getting it done as fast as possible for me, mm-hmm. because I, there's a certain amount of excitement and energy. Same thing with editing, same thing with everything that I have for a project. And I try to capture that while the excitement and the, you know, the inspiration is there because, you know, I've gotten so many ideas about other films that I like to get this one done and then move on to the next one. Like I've Mm -hmm. I've got, we just finished post on another one, another uh, Lovecraft film. And now I've got another true crime serial killer film that I have to start writing to start shooting that in March. So it's all about keeping that excitement Mm -hmm. and that flow for each particular project before it kind of burns out on it, you know, because, So many things you, you you just you could edit a film over and over or you can write a script over and over and over and over. And does it necessarily get better? Uh, it, the only person it needs to get better for is the creator. And, you mm-hmm. know, when it comes to a script, if I feel confident with it and I feel happy with it, then, you know, it's moving on because it's going to become a different animal when you get on the set and an actor is saying those lines. Sometimes the lines sound like crap. Sometimes they sound better. Sometimes if they improvise something, it. it works even better for that or you come up with something on the set you know it's just one of those things where it's always a living breathing you know creation Mm -hmm. until you know it's out you know on streaming you know Mm -hmm. or or in the theaters or on you know vhs or whatever it might be it's it's it's, for me it's i try to keep that energy as fast as possible because i know i'm going to burn out on it Mm-hmm. So I'm curious. So, and this sort of leads me to my next question. So you're going to write a, sc- a full screenplay, feature film screenplay starting tomorrow, I guess. And then you're going to shoot it in March. So sure. how much do you have? And, and is this typical? How much do you have already prepared? Clearly you have a strong idea in your head, but have you already done like an outline? Do you have index cards? What do you have going into this process? No, I really, I don't do really any preparation for any of it. I, I kind of, to go by my gut and it's on the, the next one it's based again on a true story so i pull up as much information on this um the the true uh, character it's based on ingest as much of that as i can and then once i the first scene clicks and i figure that out visually the writing kind of writes itself hmm. it's 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 just you know if, if it or if it's something that's not based on a true person and it's just kind of in my head it's once whether it's the opening scene, whether it's the ending, whether it's whatever character, once I get that click for a certain scene that works for me artistically, it kind of inspires me. And especially if the money is there that I know how much we have to make the thing for, then it's even easier to get it done because for me, you know, time is money. So if it's, if I'm just sitting around and not working and getting it done in a certain time, it's even got less value. So I try to, you know, mm-hmm. that's when the two weeks comes up. Cause it's like, if you're making a $50,000 film and you know, the, the script took you three years to write, then it's, you know, yeah. 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 You're right. It doesn't justify the time. Too. How do you approach sort of genre requirements, screenplay structure, that sort of stuff? Are you a Sid Field, you know, act breaks, midpoints, um, save the cat with all the inciting incidents, that sort of stuff. But how do you approach screenplay structure? No, I just, you know, again, I kind of go with my gut and again, watching, you know, multitude of films <laughs> you know for, mm-hmm. and, and you know love doing that and then whether it's you know or reading a screenplay i mean you read you know rio bravo is one of the greatest screenplays ever written i mean you read that and it you know you, whether you're following that structure or any of the scripts by richard matheson or who's another amazing writer and a great script writer um it, it's just kind of following what what works for me. I don't, you know, really necessarily follow the uh, the guidelines of it or whatever act. It's just I kind of instinctually write what comes and what feels good, and you know, mm-hmm. it's really all by instinct. And so you're going so quickly. Um, what does your development process look like? Like in the case of Scalper, it sounds like you had worked with this actress before. Did you send it out to her, get some notes, do some rewriting, or you're pretty much two weeks, you got a draft and you're, you're ready to go into pre-production? 
No, I, I always send it out to, uh, you know, whether it be uh, the, the actors I regularly work with or the um, producers I work with and just, you know, get their notes on it, get their thoughts on it, then take another pass on it and then, you know, send it back to them. And if they, they're like, hey, this is pretty good. Let's give it a try. Then I'm, I'm usually confident enough to say, OK, mm -hmm. let's pull the trigger and do it. OK. OK. So once you had a version of Scalper that you liked, you had the script ready to go. What were those next steps? Um, you're also a producer on the project. So what does raising money for something like this look like? Yeah, it's usually, you know, you, once the script is kind of in a happy place, you send it out to possible investors and, the, the, you know, sometimes they come in with 20 grand, 10 grand here, there, and you find like five people that are willing to do that. And then you basically have, mm -hmm. you know, your budget, you shoot it in nine days. And like I said, I usually edit very fast. So a, a rough cut is done within a week send that out to the other uh, people, same way as the script, and you get kind of notes on the edit, then you polish it up a little bit, and then after two weeks, picture's locked, send it to the uh, sound mixer and the colorist, and you start, you know, getting the other elements of post done. Gotcha. You have any tips for finding these investors? I mean, you've been doing so many movies for so many years. I'm sure there's a lot of repeat business and just people that know you and that sort of stuff. But for someone starting out, um, how do you recommend someone, ha if they have a screenplay that they want to do low budget, how do you recommend they find some of these types of investors? Um, you know, that's really the hardest part of this whole thing is finding people that, uh, you know, have, you know, 20 grand here or 100 grand or whatever it might be. And getting them excited by it. And sometimes it, it, it's just like if they if they aspire to be an actor or they aspire to be a producer, that helps. And then they're like, if they have money, they can put it in. Or if they know someone else that has money, it's kind of like a, you know, a chain letter is someone mm -hmm. down the line. If, if you find an actor, you're like, hey, this is great for you, but we need another 20 grand to make it. And they're like, hey, I've got a friend who's a dentist in Oxnard and he's got an extra 50 grand and he's always wanted to be a producer. Bingo. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it, it's kind of just putting the feelers out there to as many people as you know, and the wider your circle grows by different actors you've worked with or different, you know, producers. And you say, Hey, look, we just need another 10 for this or another five. Well, I know this guy that, uh, he's, he's always wanted to be a producer and he's got, you know, a little bit of money, just sold some land, you know, mm -hmm. you never know who out there might be interested. So mm -hmm. it's kind of just going with an open mind and an open, you know, thing to it. If you find someone in, you know, a dentist who's like, Hey, I've got 50 grand, but I want my daughter to have a role okay <laughs> so you know i'm totally open to that and you know able to say you know i'm not uh my style of filmmaking and of getting these done isn't a rigid it's it's an open flowing thing so if this dentist says hey i actually want to be the star of the movie then you know you say well hey let's screen test you let's see how you are and if, if it works and if he's great then great then you've got you know the mm -hmm. The budget is solved. But if he stinks, then you try to talk him into say, hey, would you do this smaller role instead and kind of work, you know, massage it into uh, a, a way that's, you know, uh, beneficial to everybody. Mm -hmm. Do you do you, when you have when you're gearing up for a project, do you do like a pitch deck and, you know, that sort of stuff? And then what do you promise these investors? I mean, it sounds like part of your your angle is not necessarily promising them ROI as much as promising them, hey, you'll get some other value out of this, whether it's a role for your daughter or a producing credit or that sort of stuff. Maybe you can speak to that a little bit. What does your pitch actually look like to the to the investors? Yeah, no, I don't do any of the pitch deck or any of that stuff. I mean, you know, those are, you know, cutting a trailer, doing the uh, synopsis, all those I find are the hardest part of uh, filmmaking, the selling it and the doing, you know, these things are tough. I just tell them, look, you know, we make these movies, you know, fast and cheap and they get distributed and they get a little theatrical run and they get this and you get this. If you're putting in, say, $50,000 on a $100,000 budget, you get you get X percent of the film ownership throughout the world whether it's 20 percent or whatever it is and you get that percentage back from every dollar that comes in i don't do the return of investment stuff because you know normally i'm working on these for points i don't usually get paid i don't usually get anything it's just i own 50 percent of the film or 20 percent of the film or whatever it might be budget wise and then every when the film sells every dime that comes in is split up to all the people that put money in or whatever it might be Gotcha. Gotcha. Can you give us any advice um, as an independent filmmaker myself? I'm always just looking for solid advice on finding reputable distributors. Um, how do you find you know a good distributor that's actually going to send you back some money? Yeah, I mean, that's probably, you know, one of the harder parts is, is finding someone that will not only give you, you know, usually some money up front and minimum guarantee 
and then, uh, you know, a nice split on the back end. And then, you know, if they're getting it out there and, you know, check their other pro their other films and talk to their to other filmmakers that have worked with them. Mm-hmm. And if they give, you know, a, a high recommendation, then, you know, go with them. And, and it's mm-hmm. really how how willing how much do they love the film? You know, it's if they're saying we're going to give you this much up front, we're going to do this, this and this and then nothing else then you kind of got to be wary like with breaking glass who i've worked with a few times have been fantastic i mean they give you know a, a great deal they're with they they're open in you know if i demand physical media with the project or if a, a theatrical run they're willing to negotiate and give that and that's you know a beneficial thing to me as a filmmaker is wanting to get the film out as many uh, venues as possible, whether it's streaming and whatever, mm-hmm. but uh, as well as physical media, theatrical, and all the things that I love as uh, a film goer is to see, you know, a film on the big screen or to go to my local library and rent it for off the shelf. You know, it's mm-hmm. one of those things where I'd like my film to have that opportunity as well. So I kind of work that into the uh, contracts. Gotcha. So for Scalper, who is the distributor on that? Uh, Breaking Glass Pictures. Who okay, just, and so you've worked with them now numerous times. So you have a good relationship with them. Is yeah, the I have a, a great relationship with them. And it's one of those things of, you know, I let them take a look at even, you know, they just looked at the rough cut of my latest film. And, it, you know, it's it's seeing, you know, what can work out. And then I go to Lionsgate and the other people I've, I know personally and have, you know, submitted films to before in the past. And you, you, you see what they're, if they're interested in, if they have a better offer or if they have mm-hmm. a whatever, and then you kind of see who's willing to do the best deal, mm-hmm. you know, it, whether I worked with someone before or not, each film to me is a different thing. So I don't necessarily, you know, guarantee it to them. I'll do the same. Um, um, what I do with every film is play the festivals see what kind of reception it gets. If you get into a major festival, that'll amp up the value of it. And then you're able to use that as kind of a bartering tool. Hey, it played Sundance. So, Mm -hmm. you know, that, you know, you're going to get more money up front or you're going to get a better kind of deal because it's, it's got some, um, some oomph behind it, Mm -hmm. you know, but pretty much all your films, you raise the money yourself and then you finish the film and then you take it to distributor. Even like now you wouldn't pitch a script to breaking glass and they wouldn't come in and give you some of the funding. You would, you would fund it yourself. They possibly could. I mean, that's one of those things that, you know, like on the next film I'm doing, we've got, you know, 50,000 in place and we need another 50. So I would go to them and say, Hey, here's what, it is. It's a true crime film similar to Pig Killer, which they also released, which was true crime and is doing, you know, well. So they would say, well, it's doing this much, this much. We could offer you, you know, this much. So they would put, kind of pre buy it in a sense. They would mm-hmm. say, you know, we'd give you, you know, 50,000 right now. And that would be against how much uh, we would give you up front when you uh, finish it and release it and kind of thing. Gotcha. Gotcha. How can people see Scalper? What is the release schedule going to be like for that film? Uh, I believe it comes out on the 16th and it's streaming everywhere. And then uh, they're doing a little theatrical run, I think, on the 19th for about a week and different um, theaters across uh, the country. Okay, perfect, perfect. And is there anything you've seen recently? I always like to end the interviews just by asking the guests, is there anything you've been watching HBO, Netflix that you can recommend to our mostly screenwriting audience? Well, I I, I recommend uh, Toby Hooper's... um, uh, Salem's lot because the great, uh, David soul just passed away and he was okay. a true icon. So go mm-hmm. rewatch Salem's lot, the 1979 film. It's an amazing, not only an amazing film, but it's kind of a tribute to watch it again with, uh, to David soul who just passed away. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great recommendation. It's been a number of years since I've seen that, but I do, that is a great film. Um, what's the best way for people to keep up with what you're doing? Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Um, I'll get those for the show notes, but if you're on any of those, we can, yeah, I'm on, you know, Twitter, uh, Facebook, uh, Instagram, just type in my name and you'll find me. Okay, perfect, perfect. Yeah, as I said, I'll link to all those in the show notes. People can click over to those. Chad, I really appreciate you coming on the show today and, and talking about your films. Good luck with this film and good luck with all your future films as well. Hey, thanks for having me and uh, we'll see you again. Thank you. We'll talk to you later. Bye. Bye. A quick plug for the SYS Screenwriting Analysis Service. It's a really economical way to get a high quality professional evaluation on your screenplay. When you buy our three pack, you get evaluations at just $67 per script for feature films and just $55 for teleplays. 
All the readers have professional experience reading for studios, production companies, contests, and agencies. You can read a short bio on each reader on our website, and you can pick the reader who you think is the best fit for your script. Turnaround time is usually just a few days, but rarely more than a week. The readers will evaluate your script on six key factors, concept, character, structure, marketability, tone, and overall craft, which includes formatting, spelling, and grammar. Every script will get a grade of pass, consider, or recommend, which should help you roughly understand where your script might rank if you were to submit it to a production company or agency. We can provide an analysis on features or television scripts. We also do proofreading without any analysis. We will also look at a treatment or outline and give you the same analysis on it. So if you're looking to vet some of your project ideas, this is a great way to do it. We will also write your logline and synopsis for you. You can add this logline and synopsis writing service to an analysis, or you can simply purchase this service as a standalone product. As a bonus, if your screenplay gets a recommend or a consider from one of our readers, you get to list the screenplay in the SYS Select database, which is a database for producers to find screenplays and a big part of our SYS Select program. Producers are in the database searching for material on a daily basis. So it's another great way to get your material in front of them. As a further bonus, if your script gets a recommend from one of our readers, your screenplay will get included in our monthly best of newsletter. Each month we send out a newsletter that highlights the best screenplays that have come through our script analysis service. This is monthly newsletter that goes out to our list of over 400 producers who are actively looking for material. So again, this is another great way to get your material out there. So if you want a professional evaluation of your screenplay at a very reasonable price, check out www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash consultants. Again, that's sellingyourscreenplay.com slash consultants. On the next episode of the podcast, I'm going to be interviewing entertainment attorney jo Joshua Lastine. He has got lots of experience working with writers, directors, producers, and also production companies as a lawyer. I pepper him with legal questions. Obviously, I don't have a background as a lawyer. I get a lot of legal questions through selling your screenplay. People have various legal questions that pertain to screenwriting. Obviously, I'm not a lawyer, so I really can't give um, you know intelligent legal advice to anyone. Um, so it's nice to just have him on. And as I said, I just pepper him with legal questions. We talk about NDAs and release forms. These are definitely things you're going to run into as a screenwriter as you start to submit your script. We talk about options and sales. Hopefully, as you submit your script, you will be presented with some option contracts and some, some fully some sales contracts where you actually sell your material. So we kind of go over those, how those deals work work, how you can um, find a lawyer to potentially help you with those deals. We talk about getting the rights for a novel. If you're interested in potentially adapting a book or some other intellectual property, um, we talk about that a little bit and how those sorts of deals work. We talk about how to get a deal um, and what those deals look like for screenwriters with streaming companies like Netflix. Um, so lots of great information for screenwriters. Joshua is just very practical um, and really gives a lot of great information. So keep an eye out for that episode. As I mentioned last episode, I'm only publishing a new episode now once per month. So this episode with Joshua will publish the first Monday of March, which will be March 4th. So keep an eye out for that episode next month. That's the show. Thank you for listening.